盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘 ，Psychast。Part two: Further analysis and discussion. In our previous instalment, we discussed how moral philosophy influenced the founding fathers' personal and political development, and the emphasis they placed on living virtuously. It might be interesting to begin this section then by challenging the role that virtue ought to play within political life. In our episode on Machiavelli, we spoke about. The ruler portrayed in the prince, who, unlike the ruler of Confucian political philosophy, for example, must live a life of virtue and vice in order to maintain order. But the founders aspire to embody virtue in all aspects of their character. But I wonder if this is what we really want from our rulers. At times, don't we want them to deceive and betray on behalf for the good of the nation? What do you make of this Machiavellian critique, Jeff? That. The founding fathers were too good to be rulers. Aspired to be too good, rather. The founders read Machiavelli, and in fact, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, written by George Mason, talks about the importance of frequent recurrence to the virtues of temperance and prudence, which Mason was quoting from Machiavelli. There's much to say about the clash between the civic republicans who insisted on. Achieving virtue in common for the benefit of the polity and the liberals who put more faith in institutional checks. At the moment, America's about to have a presidential election where there's a widespread fear of demagogues, populists who flatter the people and exalt their own ambition in an effort either to divide the union or. Install themselves as authoritarians, and that fear was so central to the founders, who were worried all the time about demagogues, populist demagogues, who would do just this. There's an amazing letter from Thomas Jefferson where he worries about when he first reads the Constitution、mm. about the possibility that a president will lose a campaign for re-election by a few votes. Cry foul, enlist the hopes of the states who voted for him, and install himself as a dictator for life. It's really striking. And Hamilton also, who was less afraid of a strong executive, feared that a demagogue like Aaron Burr would install himself as a dictator for life by flattering the people. So all this is to say that the founders' fears of demagogues are hardly irrelevant. In fact, new mass communication technology has increased the possibility that a political leader can. Play the popular arts and ride horseback, as they would have put it, or just take to Twitter to subvert the constitutional system. And in that sense, the founders' fears about virtues were hardly overstated. What is it about mass communication and modern technology, do you think, which gives rise to this?、Um, imagine you could, in the founders' day, communicate messages through print and the like. Is it just the speed on which they can do it now? Why do we see these fears that the founders have coming to the surface? It's a fulfillment of the founders' fears of mob rule. They're trying to design an executive that never communicates directly with the people. The idea of a tweeting president would be Madison's nightmare because he wants the executive <laughs> to be insulated from populist pressures. That's the whole point of the electoral college and the other filtering mechanisms. So that he can rule on behalf of the public good, it was a new conception of the office during the election of 1912, when both Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson insisted for the first time that the president is a tribune of the people and and should channel their will. In contrast to the constitutionalist William Howard Taft, who says that the president's job is to resist populist passions, and that combined with this new technology allows the president to be a tribune and, and channel public opinion in a really Direct way, and once you have presidents who are both communicating directly with the people and also being sensitive to the demands of the most extreme mobilized factions of both parties, you really have achieved the founders' nightmare. Just to double down on this Machiavellian critique, Jeff. Another reason Machiavelli argues for his more nefarious version of virtue is because of something he calls fortuna, 
Now, in The Prince, Fortuna is compared to a chaotic river which is capable of flooding away trees, buildings, and generally causing carnage. And Fortuna is responsible for things like famine, disease, natural disasters, and it can provoke instability and threaten authority. And Machiavelli argues that cultivating virtue gives rulers a head start on preparing for any havoc that Fortuna might decide to wreak. And his version of that is obviously the more positive and negative virtues. He argues that rulers who will follow Fortuna to dominate them are weak and ineffective. It could be argued that we're living in a time of relentless Fortuna. We've had economic recession, pandemics, the rise of polarisation, mass communication that you just mentioned and misinformation. Does Machiavelli have a point? Do moral virtues hold us back in times where action is needed against the chaos that Fortuna is throwing our way? The question of whether or not leaders are free to act virtuously in the face of Fortuna, given the public's demands for an immediate response, are crucial. The idea of the precautionary principle where every natural disaster has to be insulated against or protected against is not a Machiavellian one, but it's a demand inherent in a democratic society. So Mm. there may be the combination of the technologies and also the arrangements of mass democracy itself that makes Machiavelli's wisdom hard to follow. On the topic of maintaining order amongst the population and this mob rule, there were clearly some important philosophical disagreements between the founders. For example, Jefferson defended the view that a strong government wasn't needed to control people's emotions and impulses, as by nature, we're disposed to act well towards our fellow humans. But in contrast, John Adams thought that a strong government was needed to restrain people's violent passions and promote public virtue. Was there a more general consensus between the founders as to which of these men was right, whether it be Jefferson's positive Rousseauian view of human nature or John Adams's pessimistic Hobbesianism. You stated very well, and no, there was no consensus. It was that division that led to the rise of America's first two political parties. The Federalists, led by Hamilton and and John Adams, took a dark view of human nature, believed that people were inherently fallen, that a strong central government was necessary to restrain passions, and also to unleash the creative economic energies on a national level that would lead to human flourishing. And the Jeffersonians, called the Democratic Republicans, took a rosier view of human perfectibility, imagined virtuous self-government at the local level in agrarian shires, and wanted a night watchman state that would govern least, allowing people's innate virtuous energies to flourish at the local level. What's so remarkable is that that divide between Hamilton and Jefferson, between nationalism and states' rights persisted through all of American history, and it persists today. In what sense does it still persist today, Jeff, this nationalism versus states' rights, this Jefferson v. Adams debate in the history of the development of American thought? It's really remarkable when you think about the fact that we have had four great periods of constitutional change in American history, the founding, Reconstruction, the New Deal, and then the Reagan Revolution. And it was Ronald Reagan who, in 1980, came to office insisting that the problem was too much government rather than too little. And he pledged to appoint Jeffersonian justices to the Supreme Court that would rein in the excesses of the post-New Deal administrative state and return us to a more federated system. And our debates on the U.S. Supreme Court today are playing out the initial debate between Hamilton and Jefferson about the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States. Mm. This may be the term when the Supreme Court strikes down much of pillars of the administrative state, like the doctrines that require judicial deference to administrative actions, and all of that will be playing out Hamilton and Jefferson's initial debate. We mentioned slavery at the end of our previous installment, Jeff, and how the founders fell short in the exercising of their own virtues, even in their own words. Do you notice or are you aware of what any systemic social norms are in our current society that you think are detracting us from our individual or collective virtues? We began our discussion by talking about a total transformation in the conception of happiness from being good to feeling good. And so much of pop culture celebrates immediate gratification and you do you and uh, the me decade and whatever phrases you want. And so much of the technology of social media is set up to encourage 
immediate gratification rather than the long view and rage to engage posts based on passion traveling further and faster than posts based on reason. It's almost as if all of the technology and cultural norms favor immediate gratification rather than sober second thoughts. Now, there's been a lot of criticisms of the American founding fathers and enlightenment philosophy in particular in current times. One of our previous guests, Candy Andrews, who's professor of black studies at Birmingham City University, he argues that, quote, the enlightenment was little more than white identity politics, yet its racist knowledge still underpins university education today. Do you feel that the modern criticisms of the founding fathers that they thought that white thinking, the thinkings of Europeans particularly, was special and ignored other type of thinking or non-white ideas from further afield, does that limit their intellectual value? As in, rather than continuing to emphasize the thought of the founders, would our efforts in pursuit of virtue be better spent looking at less mainstream non-white ideas from further afield? It's remarkable how ahistorical and unconvincing mm. the critique is. In fact, it was Enlightenment liberalism that inspired abolitionists and African-American heroes to end slavery and fight for the fulfillment of the promises of the Declaration. And what's so striking about American history is that it was Prince Hall and David Walker and Phyllis Wheatley and then the great Frederick Douglass who insisted that America live up to the Enlightenment ideals, not that it abandon them. And Frederick Douglass was inspired to embrace those ideals by reading The Columbian Orator, a book that he bought on the streets of Baltimore and paid for in bread. And he thought that learning to read that book transformed his conception of himself as a man and as a citizen and led him to embrace the ideals in his great What to a Slave is the Fourth of July speech and his defense of self-reliance. It was King on the Mall who said that America had to live up to its ideals, and he loved it so much that he criticized America for failing to make the promissory note of the Declaration a reality while insisting that the arc always points upward toward justice. So it's mm. just completely inconsistent with the moral framework of the greatest defenders, the greatest black defenders of mm. freedom in American history. It's a repudiation of the black intellectual tradition to deny the centrality of classical moral philosophy to black people. As we've discussed, the focus in the book is the founders of the United States, uh, but you allow yourself to speak about what the founders would make of some contemporary figures and issues towards the end of your book. Like you mentioned before, the 2024 US presidential election is scheduled to take place at the beginning of November this year, and the main candidates being the incumbent President Joe Biden and his predecessor Donald Trump. Now, we're not going to ask you who you think you know, should be the winner or who would be the winner of that election. But what do you think the founding fathers, men who held the pursuit of virtue to be so important to personal and national prosperity, what do you think they would make of presidents such as Biden and Trump? Well, there's no question that January 6th was the founders' nightmare. They devised the entire system to resist demagogues who would try to subvert the union by violence and undermine the Constitution and their fear of mob rule, which they embodied in the Constitution, was rebuked by January 6th. That's, it's just not a partisan statement to say that they really were afraid of populist demagogues who, who mm. would subvert the Constitution and, and threaten to rule as authoritarians. I'm not going to try to channel how, you know, who they'd vote for in the, in the election, and, and no doubt Joe Biden is no apotheosis of the founders' hopes for virtuous wisdom either. But it's urgently important to recognize the fact that the whole system is set up to avoid factions, mob rule, and authoritarian demagogues. Not to be too candid with this question, Jeff, but I'm just curious, do you think the founding fathers would have had anything to say about the age of someone, particularly being president? You know, would there be a particular age where someone may not be able to kind of do the job properly, so to speak? I, I mean, I haven't seen any secret message from Alexander Hamilton about what the cutoff is, and it, it certainly is inspiring <laughs> to see Adams and Jefferson in their 80s with those beautiful letters among the most inspiring in history. But, you know, it was, uh, I think they could have imagined generally people living this long, and it's a tough job. I was quite surprised to see that neither of these figures, Biden or Trump, were mentioned towards the end of the book, especially when you're discussing these current affairs. 
Is there a reason why this discussion wasn't included? I would have thought that your reviewers of your manuscript with the election just around the corner would be encouraging you to throw your hat into the ring. This is a book about the ancient wisdom. This is going to li- <laughs> live on, of course, for its many centuries, and we wouldn't want to date it with a, something as time-bound as the election. It's pretty obvious. And the fears of demagogues are quite serious. Those are structural concerns that transcend this particular election, and I was clear about what the founders would have thought about that, you know, beyond that. I don't have any special wisdom about punditry, about who's going to win. You do speak, as I say, about some other themes towards the end of the book, such as how the Stoics have been brought back in the form of modern psychology and self-help. Quoting you from the book here, soon after cognitive behavioral therapy resurrected the ancient wisdom about how to address anxiety and depression through reason self-reflection, Facebook, Twitter, also known as the X, and smartphones exploded on the scene, the founders would not have been surprised that heavy use of social media increases anxiety and decreases happiness. I'm interested to know what inspired the second part of this sentence, that the founders would not have been surprised that heavy use of social media increases anxiety and decreases happiness. Why don't you think the founders would have enjoyed Facebook and Twitter? (laughs) <laughs> you know, this sort of founders channeling is a professional danger of uh, writing about too much about the founders. I don't, I don't mean to be presuming to be a medium for Alexander Hamilton on X. What I meant is they spend so much time emphasizing the importance of impulse control and to the degree that the mm. that social media discourages that they wouldn't be surprised that it makes us miserable. But beyond that, who knows? Maybe, you know, Hamilton is now a international rap star, so maybe he would have enjoyed Instagram. <laughs> Let us pause for a wee jiffy to say a quick thank you to all of our virtuously temperate patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man who holds his breath when people criticise the virtuous founding fathers. It's Jamie Lung. He's so filthy rich, he lives on top of Mount Rushmore. It's Joe Richardson. He loves to drive a big gas-guzzling SUV. It's not Benjamin Franklin, it's Matt Carrera. He pursues life, liberty, and the pursuit of bananas. It's Christian Mayunki. Unlike many modern Americans, he loves a good hike. It's Walker Barnes. Roger Sherman may have had 15 kids, but he was only half as romantic as Michael Kisley. He cracked the Liberty Bell with his electric powers. It's Neural Surge. He believes in people power, but equally he also believes in sheeple power. It's Anthony Welsh. Her lack of virtue in cleanliness doesn't make her feel good. It's Elijah Hughes. And last, but certainly not least, the lost founding father who wrestles the virtues into submission with his strength of character and unflinching moral values. The American dream personified in a human male, Mr. Jim Clare. If you're enjoying the show and you want to promote the pursuit of life and liberty then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansidecast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. In the Federalist Papers, Jeff, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton spoke about the importance of ensuring the open deliberation of ideas, free from the threat of violence. Jefferson defended this idea too, claiming that freedom of conscience was an inalienable right. This is a very Lockean idea, that is, freedom of speech, you know, itself deliberated in political discourse. What do you think Madison and Hamilton would make of our contemporary debates on this topic, especially in relation to the deliberately or accidentally misleading information people are exposed to on social media? Do you think they'd be calling for more restrictions? It was important for me to trace Madison's definition of the unalienable rights of conscience to Francis Hutcheson, the great Scottish Enlightenment thinker, who explains that because we can't command ourselves or anyone else to think as we please, reason is unalienable and and can't be surrendered to government even if we want it to be. So the centrality of freedom of conscience as an unalienable right is based on the Enlightenment faith in reason, and it's a faith in reason that led the founders to conclude that efforts to suppress speech were likely to be ineffective as well as dangerous because the mind must be free. Threats to reason are rampant, and AI is not the least of them in the grave. Threats to the whole Enlightenment project risked by a media landscape where machines hallucinate 
and distinguishing falsehood from truth is more difficult than ever. Would their response have been suppression? I don't think so, because of Jefferson's fundamental belief that in a fair contest, truth will always vanquish error, that it is public deliberation that determines the discovery and spread of political truth, as long as there be time for deliberation. As Brandeis said, channeling Jefferson in the Whitney case, there's an interesting debate about whether, given the speed of communication, there's enough time to allow reason to diffuse across the land. If there's not, though, the solution is to focus on the imminence of the threat and to only allow restrictions if a ban is likely to prevent imminent and serious harm that's intended. And there's no evidence, given how fast stuff is moving, that bans would prevent imminent threats. So for all these reasons, I believe that they would be squarely behind the American free speech tradition, which remains the crown jewel of our libertarian legacy, and agree with Jefferson and Brandeis that speech should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent lawless action. The CEO of the National Constitution Center, and there's probably uh, no better person to ask this question, right? I wonder if you share perhaps a worry that uh, I certainly have, let's say, that people may take these inalienable rights as defined by the Constitution as to be inalienable, so that they can never be challenged, as in the sense that the right to bear arms, you might think the Second Amendment leads to significant amounts of harm, or the rigidness of a principle of freedom of conscience might allow for the platforming and freedom to spread misleading ideas. Is there a worry that people defending the Constitution might take these amendments to be if you'll excuse the pun, non-amendable. The right to bear arms is not an unalienable right. It's an alienable right. The founders were very precise about distinguishing between alienable rights that where you could surrender the government the power to control and regulate them ah. and unalienable rights that can't be surrendered even if you want to. So that's mm. why even if I want to allow the government to regulate my freedom of thought, it can't because I'm going to think as I please based on the external sensations presented to my reasoning mind. The government tells me to think X and I think Y, even allowing regulation is not going to change that. Whereas the right to bear arms is, as the preamble says, that given the need for a well-regulated militia can certainly be regulated, although the terms are a matter of debate before the Supreme Court. The pristine radicalism of the Enlightenment faith in reason has served America well. It's, it's what's allowed us, despite all of the threats to liberty to maintain the constitutional system. And in that sense, the founder's faith and reason has been vindicated. When we spoke to Christian B. Miller, he argued that hundreds of recent studies in psychology tell us that we all have serious character flaws that prevent us from being as good as we think we are or would like to be. For example, most of us in a group of bystanders will do nothing as someone cries out for help in an emergency. But in some situations, we will go out of our way to help people as well. So... So much, Miller argues, depends on cues in our social environment. And what do you make of this, Jeff? Does the social environment of ordinary people and politicians today have a bigger impact on their behaviour and their ability to be virtuous than their philosophical roots and ideals? I'm not an expert on, on these social influences of behaviour, but it certainly was central to the founders that our group settings did indeed influence our behaviour. There was a big debate about whether conscience or the moral sense was intuitive or hardwired or not. But those who thought that it was, beginning with Cicero, believe that we take our empathy from what we observe around us to the degree that these old virtues of self-reliance and industry and, and self-mastery are no longer widely taught by teachers and communities. They'll certainly be harder to follow. Would you like to see character education implemented more strongly in the US, Jeff? I mean, in, here in the UK, we've seen quite a strong resurgence of interest into virtue ethics, character education, and the implementation of schemes such as them into secondary schools. Is that quite naive about the education system in the US more generally? Do you have something like that already? Or if not, would you like to see something brought in? Well, we are at the National Constitution Center exploring the possibility of character education classes centered on, on the founders and virtues. The idea is that people learn by example and studying the inspiring stories of the founders that we've been talking about. 
and their struggles to achieve these virtues might be a good way of inspiring people to follow them. These would be voluntary elective classes that the NCC would offer free and online, but we're exploring it and it could be exciting to develop. Can I push you on the state level? That sounds like a like an interesting project that would get a lot of people interested, but I wonder if we want to instill this uh, more widely and from an earlier age, is this something you'd like to see in state education? Yes, the goal of these classes would be to be adopted at the state level and in classrooms. Uh, we, we have a decentralized system in America. Mandates of any kind are not successful and, and not loved. They, they just don't work. So the challenge of getting teachers starting at the local and state level to adopt civics curriculum of any kind is one that the National Constitution Center is centrally involved with. Just mm-hmm. to give you a sense of our outreach efforts, we have a great partnership with Khan Academy, which is one of the leading providers of free online education. And we're launching a Civics 101, a Constitution 101 class in the fall that we hope that classrooms at all level beginning in high school will choose to adopt either in full or as modules to supplement their existing curriculum. So a character education curriculum or elective would be part of a network like that. And it's all a question of developing the networks. A final question from us, Jeff. You need to settle a debate for us. Richard Henry Lee claimed that Jefferson copied the Declaration of Independence from Locke's treaties of government, which Jefferson, of course, denied. What do you make of Jefferson's denial? As you say yourself, a lot of the language from Locke and other sources is mirrored in the Declaration. If you receive this, perhaps in your law class at George Washington University, would you be flagging it for plagiarism or <laughs> top marks? Well, the software is pretty good right now, as we know, so there's nowhere to hide. Jefferson definitely took passages in the Bill of Particulars against King George from Locke. But the central sentence, the famous sentence about we hold these truths to be self-evident, was not, in fact, primarily taken from Locke from the Second Treatise. Because the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, appears not in Locke's second treatise, but in Locke's essay concerning human understanding. And as we've been discussing, it also appears in many of the other sources that he flagged as influences on the Declaration, including Cicero and Aristotle, and then the many, many, many other Mm. sources that I discuss in the book, primarily the Virginia Declaration of Rights by George Mason Mm. and James Wilson's essay concerning the extent of legislative authority in Britain. And then all, you know, it it just, that's the pleasure of the book is identifying the many, many other sources that used the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. So to attribute it all to Locke would be deeply unjust to the Christian, classical, Whig, civic Republican, and Blackstonian geniuses who used the phrase as well. And in that sense, Jefferson was right that far from copying Locke or any one source, he was just distilling the basic principles of the American mind that were in the air at that time. I hear you loud and clear. You copy from one person, it's plagiarism. You copy from many, then it's research. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> A round of concluding remarks. Would you like to kick us off, Mr. Ali Marley? So firstly, Jeff, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. I think your work with the NCC is absolutely fantastic. And I think that, you know, especially approaching it from a position of looking at all kind of parts of the political spectrum is really important. I think, you know, just the wider cultural conversation about politics at the moment is quite in a very interesting place. For some, it's either boring or just a massive shouting match. And actually kind of your work on focusing on enlightenment values, focusing on reason, I think is a very refreshing voice. And I think that, you know, your book is absolutely fantastic. You know, in we haven't really mentioned it in the episode, but you take like particular virtues and explore them through different founding fathers and just your enthusiasm for the topic just bleeds through the pages and not just in kind of like a you know this is a work of moral philosophy way the creativity of the way you've written it with the sonnets and stuff i think it's a really wonderfully refreshing engaging piece of work i think you don't find many authors and thinkers today that just unironically talk about how much they love moral philosophy and political thinking with the kind of enthusiasm that you do and the fact that you're coming at that through trying to bring everybody around the table to have a very reasonable discussion. I think we definitely need more of that. So thank you so much for writing the book and thank you so much for talking to us today. That was a wonderful review, Ollie. I'd like to echo all of Ollie's concluding remarks as well and, and say, Jeff, that I got 
a lot from the book, starting just from some of the advice in there, which we didn't take. I know you mentioned a couple of things yourself that you tried uh, Franklin's list of checking your own virtues throughout the day and trying to be more industrious. And I love some of Thomas Jefferson's advice on that, on making the most of every moment and on humility with Franklin's reluctance to offer fixed opinions as he found his views to be more readily accepted if he used gentle persuasion. Like, I conceive this, I imagine this, rather than, you know, I declare this and I argue this. And he found people are much more susceptible using that Socratic method. And I think that's a great example of the union that you bring here between the founding father figures and some of the philosophers that many of our listeners will be well read on. And it was also interesting to see how these men fell short of their ideals as well. One example that I found particularly funny was We started the interview talking about Pythagoras, and then Benjamin Franklin aims to become a vegetarian like Pythagoras, and then succumbs to the smell of fried cod, and then his his virtue went out the window. (laughs) But in short, I thought the book was extremely inspiring, and in terms of the virtues and vices that you encourage us to cultivate, I think, you you don't directly tell us, but you can't not read that book and think, hey, there's lots of things I could do to become a better person. I'm grateful for you for reminding me of that. So thank you again. Thank you both for reading the book so closely for your wonderful comments. And I'm so glad it resonated with you. I'm really eager to share all the wisdom I learned. And it's just great that it resonated with both of you. Thanks for a great conversation. Well, don't thank us just yet, Jeff, because it's time for everybody's favorite part of the show, Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop pop, 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 Philosophy Quiz. Welcome to Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. You're going to hear quotes from three figures. It's Ollie v. Jeff. And you've got to, fastest fingers, say who the quotation is from. So pay attention to these. We're playing Jeffrey Rosenvelt, Jeffrey Rosen. So we've got quotes from a Jeffrey, i.e. the American actor, best known for his roles in Dumb and Dumber, Dumb and Dumber 2, and that one season of HBO's The Newsroom, that's Jeffrey Warren Daniels. You've got quotes from Rosenvelt, i.e. the 32nd President of the United States, notably during the Second World War, Franklin D. (laughs) Roosevelt, and Jeffrey Rosen, CEO of the National Constitution Center and Professor of Law at George Washington University. So I want to hear Jeffrey, Roosevelt, or Jeffrey Rosen? Fastest finger. Instead of encouraging us to regulate our emotions, popular culture encouraged us to let them all hang out. I think that's me. That's you, Jeff. That's one nil. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. That sounds like FDR. It's FDR. It's two nil. According to the map, we've only gone four inches. That's Jeff. That's Jeff. It's two one. The whole point was to avoid mob violence. I'll take that one and give it to Madison. <laughs> That's 3-1. Men are not prisoners of fate, but only prisoners of their own minds. Is that Roosevelt? I might go with it's Roosevelt. It's 3-2. It's close. You've got a few to go. The United States used to be the best country in the world. I go, Jeff? Of the, yes, it's Jeff. It's 3-all. Three, 3 to go. I ask you to judge me by the enemies I have made. Sounds possibly Rooseveltian. It's Rooseveltian. It's 4-3 to Jeff. Pop culture was rejecting the Stoics' ancient wisdom. And that is me. And she, it's 5-3, you've won the day. Here's the last one, though, just for the kicks. What god? You clearly don't know where you are. Look around. There ain't no higher up round here to watch over you. This here's the paradise of the locust, the lizard, the snake. I look, I have to give that to Jeff, because it's not Roosevelt or me. <laughs> That's Jeff. Well done, Jeff. If you'd like to learn more about Jeffrey Rosen and his work, then please head over to thepansycast.com where you'll find links and further information to Jeff's excellent book, The Pursuit of Happiness, How the Classical Writers on Virtue Inspire the Lives of the Founders and Defined America, as well as links to all of Jeffrey's other work and links to the National Constitution Centre as well. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. Thank you for listening. Professor Jeffrey Rosen. Thank you so much. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you, Jeff. That was excellent. Great. Thank you both. Thanks for the nice words too. Really, really, really appreciate all of it. Very welcome. Thank you for putting up with the, the game at the end as well. That's always much appreciated. <laughs>